Um, hi again, everyone. Uh, this is Jeff Hild from the, the CCR team. Um, Kim, I think um, you were going to kind of kick us off with some, yeah. some opening thoughts. Yeah. So first off, uh, thank you for being here. Appreciate the opportunity to connect with, with all of you. Um, I want to say up front, I'm, I'm not a policy expert, uh, but I am impacted by policy oftentimes, but I'm, I'm excited that uh, Jeff is here to join me in this conversation. So I, I think um, kind of the conversation that we hope to have is, you know, how do we continue to ad advance um, the work that we're doing around health and wellness and equity, but particularly in light of in some of the systems that we, where we work, there are limitations. Um, so just to give you some background in terms of what we do, you know, we are a mental health provider that does everything from what used to be the state hospital program to these intensive outpatient services. And our world is very much uh, uh, regulated in, uh, by, by center CMS. I mean, so everything is based on medical necessity. You know, everything goes back to that traditional model of a diagnosis, uh, assessment, treatment plan, and then ongoing authorization uh, around utilization is active treatment happening. And we also know that, that not every child and family in their condition falls under that narrow definition of, of medical necessity. So I, I guess there's a couple things from a provider perspective that I, I would want to share is, is one, at, at kind of this meta or very broad level, Recently, I've had the opportunity to be in something called the Health Education Roundtable, which is a, a group of uh, providers, uh, school districts, care coordinating organizations, and then uh, some uh, community members that, that are looking at this confluence of health and wellness and education. And one of the, the, the provocateurs of that process is a former uh, governor of Oregon and a, a physician, John Kitzhaber. And at the highest level of policy, he, he was uh, mentioning to our group, if you look at this moment and you look at this time, that there's probably never been a greater time where people that come together um, with solutions around how best to support communities, uh, families, individuals in this environment, that there may be, that this may be the time to really make big moves as it relates to more things like you know, state waivers for health plans so that we do have more flexibility. And he reminded me that years ago when he was governor and he started the Oregon Health Plan, which ensured that all children would be covered and it, it really increased the enrollment of uh, uh, eligibility across Oregon, at the time under the, the, the rules, as it were, the health plan was essentially illegal until he wrote the waiver. A uh, few years back when uh, we started to move on to the Affordable Care Act and our, our system of care coordinating organizations overseeing these Medicaid expenditures in a more flexible way. At the time he introduced that, again, it would have been illegal if it were not for his ability to, to move a waiver and to make that change. And of course, I pose the question to him is that right now, I don't think that Oregon has the same political uh, leadership or the will. And he said, I don't think it's going to come from a central person. I think it's going to come from people all you know, these people that come together with concepts that, that best uh, support those kinds of changes. So that, that, that made me kind of rethink about how to, how to galvanize community together around potential change. And then from a, from a I guess at, the, at more of the ground level, I continue to think of, even though Medicaid uh, is restrictive in terms of um, how we've been able to use it to inform our work, it has opened doors for us. Um, I mentioned that, you know, we're in 140 schools. Those are largely funded through Medicaid, but by getting into those schools, building the health plan, it introduced us to other people. It introduced us to schools, teachers, other payers that saw the value of that work. And so knowing that these restrictions and limitations exist, if we can tell the story and identify the gaps and the resources needed to get better outcomes, then that increased our ability to get that payment through other means. It might come through foundations and the policy change there would be to move foundations to, you know, don't just think about sustainability, think about it making investments in programs right now that will make a difference in the lives of children, families and communities. 
Um, it might mean that with the state, going back to them, we've, we've made the case that, look, we're so bound by these restrictions that we're not able to really connect more deeply with families and support them in, in other things, uh, the social determinants, uh, vocation, education, health, nutrition, uh, homes, um, all of those things, um, we've been able to go back and, and to create like grant opportunities with the state. Um, in our CCO structure, that's, that's the other thing in Oregon where um, the, the, their new contract with the state, because of a lot of leveraging from the community and their new contract with the state, there's much more language about their responsibility as it relates to social determinants and uh, creating dollars for innovation and investment in programs that, that again, best support uh, families and communities. So even though you know, we're in this restrictive environment, by being connected, going out you know, into to where children and families live, you know, the connecting with schools, I think we can tell a different story, make new connections, and I think create the community being galvanized and helping us make these changes and I think getting additional resources. So it's just a reminder that policy change, I think, can happen in a variety of ways. So with that, Jeff, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Kim. So, you know, I think we wanted to kind of open this up um, for some discussion and, and given the size um, of the group, if folks want to enter comments either in the chat or use the uh, you know the Zoom feature to raise your hand, um, we can get that uh, going. And we kind of wanted just to tee up um, you know a, a pretty straightforward discussion uh, prompt, and hopefully you know some of the conversation today has stirred some uh, ideas or inspiration or excitement um, for you all. So we wanted to 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 ask. You know, from your perspective, kind of what current or forthcoming policy opportunities um, are you most excited about uh, that will really advance um, equity and build resilience uh, in communities? And then given the, you know, 50 or so folks on this call, what other sectors do you see that are uh, essential to making that uh, happen? So we'd, we'd love to get some discussion flowing and hear what's kind of giving everyone um, some juice uh, during this time. And, and of course, if you have questions on anything Kim or I've said, you know, that's um, fair game as well. <laughs> and Kim, I see we've got a, we've got a question from Elisa um, about payment models to reimburse community health workers. Um, and part of that may be a, qu a question for Jim and how they did that through Fostering Hope. Um, but have, have you been successful in CCOs supporting community health workers? Yeah, to, to a degree. I think, again, you know, kind of making the case, it's actually easier to make the case with the CCOs than it is the state in a lot of ways. The CCOs, you know, being responsible for a, a, a population of people where, where their organizations, by the way, are often located in that region as well. So it's kind of like they're, they're supporting their neighbors. Um, they've created dollars for innovation. And so not only are they paying for types of services, they have freed up dollars to invest in, so for instance, Trillium's new partnership with Fostering Hope and being able to, to get our uh, mental health services in uh, you know, supporting the, uh, those uh, supportive housing programs. They have funded that. So that was, uh, again, kind of an innovation uh, investment that they made. Even on our existing contracts, though, even like some of our psychiatric residential, all of those kinds of contracts, the CCOs are now open to more conversations around global budgets. This idea of, you know, paying on behalf of a population served, and those services could include a range of services. It could be residential, it could be, um, uh, supportive services, it could be skills training, parent training, post care. So we're all looking at models around, are there global budgets and ways to, to support that? Um, are there processes around dual authorization, not fraudulent authorization, but dual authorizations where 
somebody has both an authorization for a, a residential or inpatient as well as outpatient so that they can move within those streams depending on what their need is. Well, those are not all solved and done, it's the first time in my career that we're actually having conversations and I'm starting to see some traction there. And it does mean as a provider that we are taking on more financial risk, but over the, our first three or four years of experience and taking on some of those contracts, the, the risk has actually been in our favor. We've been able to manage that risk pretty well financially. Thanks, Kim. And I, and I think it also you know, points the need to, to look at other sectors as well. To, to support some, uh, some of this work um, and really being creative and thinking about those other sources of funding. Um, and I see, so we've got a comment, um, there's a comment from Susan around uh, potentially using CARES Act funding uh, for promotoras. Um, so Susan, I didn't know if you want to share more um, about that. And you know, we've, we've tried to, to push out a lot of information about different ways that various funding streams under the CARES Act and other COVID relief can be used. And of course, we're hopeful that there'll be you know, some additional funds with the new administration that will offer some flexibility, particularly for state and local um, governments. But Susan, I wonder if you'd wanna share anything else um, regarding your comment. Um, yeah, I mean, just thinking about it, you know, as far as funding opportunities, especially I work for public health, so it's kind of all about the CARES Act right now. But what has been nice about it is, you know, in our first round, we were able to just, um, you know, we had a lot of mini grants going out to people to do um, kind of like outreach education to different populations. And we were able to really cast a wide net without some of the hoops that normally you have to jump through. and. Um, I know we're trying to do that with the second round as far as uh, training promotoras and um, getting them out to help with, you know, vaccine education and, and kind of also just looking at this whole kind of trauma recovery effort that it's going to take quite some time, I think. Uh, it just seems like, you know, as much as I wish we didn't have to be doing it because of what's happening right now, but it does seem like CARES Act is um, really something to look at as far as, you know, kind of some high level funding right now. Yeah, th thanks for that. And um, I, I should note that the, um, the package that passed at the end of last year and was eventually signed into law did, you know, included um, some funds specifically set aside via CDC for outreach, vaccination outreach into into minority communities and communities of color. And so I imagine that that will be flowing through health departments is certainly another um, useful linkage of, um, of connecting with, with those communities. And we'll, we'll see, I think the Biden folks had planned to kind of introduce um, some of their uh, goals for, the, for another um, relief package um, uh, in the coming days. So we should have more information about what may um, be in that going forward um, as well. All right, so we're getting getting a bunch of uh, incoming through the chat. So I'm just gonna try to um, look through here quickly. Yeah, and so I think one, um, you know, one comment here that I think is worth sharing. Um, so there are a few tools, frames that are coming to mind based upon what you're saying. One, the importance of recognizing the community residents as leaders and decision makers. Um, this important work lays out a framework to help us to do it authentically. Um, and and I, th I think that's a wonderful comment. And um, Kim, I'm wondering in the context of three to PhD, um, if you'd want to, to say a, a little bit more about what that kind of community engagement process um, looked like. And I know that kind of the, the services that ended up being co-located at Fabian 
were really driven by what the community wanted and were some cases a lot different than what you know folks came into that um, yeah. thinking. Yeah, so um, you know, we early on when we we started looking at the whole construct of this collective impact model, um, there were a few things that informed the model. One is we 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 knew that it was going to be a long term partnership. This the the actual governance agreement and the operational agreement are like twenty year agreements. I mean, it's it 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 is this you know kind of all in kind of a construct, and within those gr agreements, it's very clear that that the the driver and the core partner is is the community. It's I mean the rest of us are participants, but it's very much lifted. It's very much in there that the community is is kind of the the long term decision maker in terms of of what all of the services look like. And like I mentioned earlier, even the design of the building. The other thing embedded in those documents is that you know very, very much uh, trauma informed in terms of how we think about the work that we do, but. I think just one of the fundamental things that we started out with was a commitment to each other. And again, this is a school district, it's Kaiser Permanente. Um, we, we had this kind of uh, mantra, which was that we wanted to work within community and not upon community. And that's, that really just stayed with all of us. And even with that focus, even with that focus and even with community being on all of the planning and uh, uh, the uh, community advocates co-chairing the, the whole governance system, um, even then I would say it's somewhat of a struggle not to come in and to do what you've always done and to come in and, and just, um, again, be who you've always been. And it's work. It, it's really work and it's, it's important work. So I, I would say one, these models are really helpful. And two, I think, you know, oftentimes in these innovative programs or these innovative partnerships or these commitments to each other, we sometimes don't have the discipline to live within the solutions that we create together. And it strikes me as odd because we certainly by default, you know, we, we make commitments to these long-term uh, safety net programs that are not innovative. And, and yet we do that. So how do we learn to live in these solutions that require better engagement, partnership um, with community as the driver? It's a very different model. Yeah, and we've seen, um, and we're, we're trying to dig a little deeper into this, but we've seen across the BCR network in um, communities that had sort of the infrastructure in place for, for community um, decision-making and input um, has really been a driver in how to spend some of the COVID relief dollars. Um, and you know, one example was in St. Louis where they actually had created sort of a community council structure as part of some funding they got in response to um, the, the death of Michael Brown and the civil unrest in Ferguson. And so they had this structure in place with community members um, uh, that were able to come together. And so this, the city and the county basically said, what are the key areas of need where we should be putting um, supports uh, for, you know, from these federal dollars that are coming in? And because they had that infrastructure in place, you know, they were able to kind of locate you know, where the greatest need uh, was and have a community um, you know, uh, uh, voice to help guide some of those um, decisions. And Jeff, this is Nicole. Um, I've got about five minutes left, six minutes left. And, um, but I'm also wondering if you saw, or I forget if you already addressed one of the earlier questions in the chat. Um, Melissa is asking, are jurisdictional and zoning issues relevant to policy around affordable housing? Did you already touch on that one? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, and I'll caveat this by saying that um, I'm certainly not a housing policy expert, but I think the short answer um, is yes. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that we've seen you know, in our in our work um, around the network, and um, Kim, feel free to, to chime in on the Portland experience. But yes, zoning uh, restrictions, in particular, around um, you know, non-single family 
housing in a, you know, a lot of urban areas uh, has been a real drag on housing affordability. Um, in, in terms of the question around um, area, area median income, you know, what I'm most familiar with is, is DC where there's, there's kind of a, um, a layered uh, approach around in close, inclusive zoning where um, a certain number of units can be at that kind of 80% benchmark or what they would call kind of workforce housing. Uh, and then a smaller percentage are for um, uh, more low income um, individuals. Um, so, you know, I think how that breaks down and how we define um, affordable housing and really who is it affordable to um, really are key questions. And Kim, I know this is probably a little outside of your um, realm of expertise um, as well, but I know, you know, housing affordability affordability and really displacement um, has been a huge issue um, in Portland as folks get kind of pushed out, you know, particularly the African-American community pushed out of some neighborhoods where they've uh, traditionally lived. And that's been a challenge for service providers as well, right? To, to um, uh, still provide services to those folks as they sort of move further and further outside of um, the, the city. So I don't know if you came anything else to to add there. No, just, um, I'm just struck by the, the dynamic that you mentioned, the, the gentrification of these neighborhoods. And we've, we worked really hard from a policy perspective um, because, you know, when you look at the Fabian school that we built in North Portland, uh, which was a title one school, the commitment that we made to the community is, is that it would always be a title one school that we would continue to serve the people that we had always served um, because brand new school, university connection, health services, we could have created a situation that really drove people out of the neighborhood in terms of the cost of housing and um, all of those kinds of things. But we really uh, have built into this, that idea that we will always remain a Title I school and uh, Portland Public Schools has been is really a good partner in that. And, and just the other thing I'd, I'd mention, you know, when we think about gentrification and displacement, yes, it is questions around um, affordability and economic opportunity, but it also is a question of social cohesion, right? And when folks are displaced from their communities, you know, that in and of itself is a, is a trauma, right? And, you know, we see in the district, you know, folks still returning to their old neighborhoods to go to church because they're looking to maintain that social cohesion um, you know, even when they can't afford uh, to live there. And I think, you know, we certainly, both from the policy side, need to be mindful of, pol you know, policies that encourage displacement, sometimes unintentionally, um, but also mindful of what happens post-displacement, right? And sort of acknowledging and, and realizing that, that trauma that's kind of inherent in that. All right, so I'm going to see if we've got... Here, So it looks like we, we there's one maybe follow-up question related to that, Kim, and I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but was there, so Melissa is asking, was there private rental market housing um, in the Title I, I guess, catchment area around Fabian? Um, and if so, um, how did you get the landlord um, buy-in uh, in that case? Yeah, Jeff, I really don't have that answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think, Leah, did you have a question or comment? Um. Yes, I was just curious in terms of, you know, I know you're working with a bunch of different agencies, but if there's a push or if there's any mindset, you, know, you talk a lot about community input and uh, making sure that this is a people's project, but uh, what's the work that's being done in terms of hiring and paid positions that some people who've actually been affected by these experiences are part of the team, official teams with yeah. paid work? 
So um, we have been able to um, hire folks like there's a basics has their local, we can't call it a store because of zoning, but it's a food club. And we've been able to hire some of the community members to help run that. Um, we've been able to hire some community members that help coordinate the, I mentioned the kitchen demonstration area, those types of things. But there's other conversations happening now that I'm, I'm excited about. I mentioned the CCOs and their innovation dollars. I'm real interested in, in kind of the workforce of the future. And so when, when I look at that, I also look at um, the people that we're connecting with through our mental health services have some profound stories. So if I think of what's possible with them, we've had, we've had youth graduate our highest level state hospital program that have gone on to start their own not-for-profits um, which is to me, it just, it's been, a, it's an amazing story. How do we start to connect with people early on, I think, healthcare related types of jobs, training, um, connection with uh, actual jobs? How do we use the provider sector as that kind of job experience network? And there are a couple of the care coordinating organizations with those investment dollars that are interested in how do we look at developing a workforce that really starts to develop providers, therapists, doctors, nurses, that, um, you know, that people in community say, these are people that look like me. How do we get that workforce developed in that way? And the CCOs are really interested in investing in that. And that's where I want to put a lot of my future energy is that kind of workforce development. So like um, sponsorship program so that people are helping to make sure that if you're trying to get into these lines of work that you have a yeah. team advocating for you. Yeah. And for us, we're in 140 schools. Some of those are high schools. Um, do we have a track for young people to be able to connect with some job experience? Do we have university partners that we can take a look at that pipeline of kids that are interested or youth interested in this field? So it's, it's kind of early on in the construct but we have a number of partners that are really wanting to take a look at this and foundation saying, you know, the workforce of the future, it's going to be important and healthcare jobs are going to be really important. So that's where I want to expend, like, I'm kind of in the last four or five years of, of my professional career, I would love to focus on that area as one of the primary areas. Well, I hope you're successful because I've worked in dependency for a long time and have also experienced some of the circumstances that I was trying to prevent and found myself often feeling like the outsider and yeah. my opinion seeming like it was coming from an alien universe. Yep. Um, and I don't often expose even in those settings, my personal experiences, but just the reactions I get when I'm speaking from a place of knowledge can be really dismissive and disheartening. Thank you, Leah. I appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Well, thanks. So it looks like we're getting folks kind of trickling back in. So I'm, I'm guessing that that signals the end of our breakout.